Hello and welcome. It's Friday the 9th of May. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast here on Arirang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines at this hour. Korean authorities moved to revoke the licenses of the company that operated the Sewol Ho passenger ferry that sank last month. Four more bodies were retrieved overnight, but more than 30 people remain unaccounted for. South Korea confirms the three crash drones found on its soil were sent from North Korea. Photos and mission data from the drone's cameras and memory chips showed that they took off from and were programmed to return to the north. Plus, Nigeria's president says scores of kidnapped schoolgirls will be found and their rescue will mark the beginning of the end of his country's battle against the terrorist group Boko Haram. We start where we have for the last three weeks, the Sewol Ho ferry disaster. Now, you won't find that many people willing to travel on one of their vessels, but the Korean government is making moves to revoke the business license of the operator of the sunken Sewol Ho ferry. For more details, we connect live to our Connie Kim, who has been following this story for us at our news centre. Connie, some will be asking why this has taken so long. Right, Mark. Questions are sure to come up, but a little over three weeks after the sinking, the government is, like you say, trying to revoke the business license of the ferry operator, Chung Hye Jin Marine Company. Now, this, given all the recent findings that point to negligence on the part of the captain and crew of the Seoul ferry. And two more witnesses told authorities earlier this Friday that the captain and the crew who were in the ship's steering room at the time of the accident did not fulfill their duties to help the passengers to safety. Yes, I suppose, Connie, given the scale of the disaster, the investigation, also the government's response should be a measured one. Now, the search continues for the missing passengers. We're now into the 24th day of the search and rescue efforts. What's the latest on that front? Well, Mark, four bodies were recovered on Thursday with the confirmed death toll now standing at 273. Now, 31 people remain unaccounted for as of now. Operations are currently suspended and tidal conditions are making it too dangerous for divers. But with things expected to ease up later today, rescue operations should resume in the next few hours or so. Divers will attempt to make a second complete sweep of the ferry's 64 cabins and compartments, which includes restrooms and the cafeteria. According to authorities, Thursday, two thirds of the high two thirds of the high school students recovered were found within the fourth floor where the students' rooms were located. Ninety percent of the deceased were found wearing life jackets, which means that if they had been instructed to get off the ferry, a lot more of them could have survived. Yeah, I think that's probably the saddest part of this disaster for so many people is the fact that with a responsible captain and crew, the loss of life wouldn't have been so unbelievably devastating. Now, how about the ongoing investigations? There was a big development that the uh, CEO of the ferry operator has been arrested on multiple charges and they include negligent homicide. That's right, Mark. Kim Han-sik, the president of Chang e jin Marine Company, was arrested on Thursday, and the court will review the police request this morning. He's currently facing three charges, including negligent homicide and overloading the ferry with cargo. Now, the investigative team is trying to prove Kim knew about the vessel's problems, but continued operations regardless for the sake of profits. Now, they will also look into whether Kim talked to the crew on board the Seoul ferry at the time of the accident to figure out whether he ordered rescue efforts. Also, with the past deadline for key figures related to Yu byung the former Hemo Group chairman and practical owner of Chung Jin Marine Company, prosecutors are seeking to force them, including Yu's second son, into Korea with the help of FBI after he failed to appear for questioning for the third time. And Connie, we understand that there was quite a lot of commotion between the families of the victims and Korean broadcasting system, KBS, uh, one of Korea's major broadcasters. Tell us about that. Right, Mark. On Thursday, it was reported that Kim Si Hoon, the report bureau chief at KBS, said the number of people killed in the sinking is not that big when you think of the number of people who die in traffic accidents every year. Now, Kim's remarks angered the families of the victims, and they headed straight to KBS headquarters on Thursday to demand an apology from KBS and that the newsroom chief be fired. We want to resolve this by having a conversation. You have no idea how long we've been waiting here. 
After a four-hour wait in front of the company, the report bureau chief failed to show up. Families then mo moved, tried to move to the presidential office of Cheong Wadae, but they were blocked by police. Now, Park Junu, the senior presidential secretary for political affairs, have reportedly started meeting with the relatives of the deceased. I will give you further updates as we get more, and that's all for now. But I'll be back after two hours for more updates. Well, thank you, Connie Kim, for that report. Now, in the wake of this awful tragedy, the government has announced a series of much stricter regulations to ensure the safety of passenger ferries operating within Korea. The Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries says it will expand an ordinance that was limited to only cargo vessels and foreign ships to include passenger ferries that have routes in Korean waters, and they expect to do this within the next six months. And this measure uh, passed the National Assembly, in fact, late last month. Korea's ruling and opposition parties elected new floor leaders on Thursday, but the winners will have little time uh, to celebrate. They face the critical challenge of handling the parliamentary probe into the Sewol Ho ferry disaster and its ongoing aftermath. Our Che Yusun has this report. The ruling Senuri Party's new floor leader, Lee Wan Gu, is a three term lawmaker from the central Chungcheong region. He is the first from the region to be elected party floor leader and is known to be a member of the faction close to President Park Geun hye. His running mate, Chu Ho Young, who was named the party's new policy committee chair, is part of a different faction but from the party stronghold of Gyeongsangbukdo province. The duo faces zero competition as the only candidates who applied and were appointed without a vote on Thursday. Analysts say a consensus was likely formed within the party to endorse the Yichu team for a more balanced representation of various party factions. The opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy elected the first female floor leader in Korea's constitutional history. Three-term lawmaker Park Young Sun, who came out the winner after a runoff, is thought to have garnered support from the party's newest faction, including the current co-leaders, as well as hardline junior lawmakers. <laughs> Park's electoral victory comes two months after the former Democratic Party merged with independent lawmaker An Cheol Su's camp. Her political fame and hardline stance are expected to add vigor to the newly formed party. Both new floor leaders face the tough task of negotiating when and how to carry out a parliamentary probe into last month's Sewol Ho ferry disaster and the government's response. E of the ruling party said it may be too early for parliament to investigate the accident, as the priority now is to find all of the missing passengers. He also vowed to work closely with the opposition on national safety. The opposition's PAC, on the other hand, said she will push for an immediate investigation, adding that she'll openly cooperate with the ruling side, but also keep it in check on behalf of the people. Choi yoo Sun, Arirang News. Now, a failure to revive the long-stalled six-party talks on ending North Korea's nuclear weapons program will aggravate tensions on the Korean peninsula, according to a pro-North Korea newspaper in Japan. In an editorial Thursday, the Joseon Shinbo said the United States is provoking Pyongyang with its continued military exercises on the peninsula and hegemonic strategies. It warned Washington against crossing a red line drawn by North Korea that would trigger an all out showdown. The piece also said that if the US doesn't end its provocations, the North will go ahead with its planned nuclear test. South Korea's defense minister, Kim Gwan Jin, said Thursday that North Korea has made all necessary preparations for its fourth nuclear test and is now just waiting for the right time to proceed. The final verdict is in and South Korea's defense ministry says the three unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, recently found on South Korean soil did in fact, as expected, come from North Korea. Our Kim Hyun bin reports. A joint South Korea-U.S. investigative team looking into the three unmanned area vehicles that were discovered in South Korea over a two-week period starting in late March has stated definitely that they were sent from the north. The team's report says the drones were headed back when they crashed after running out of fuel. The GPS coordinates of the UAV show that they flew over key military facilities and took dozens of pictures, a clear violation of Korea's armistice agreement and a non-aggression pact which forbids the North and South 
from infiltrating each other's airspace. South Korea's defense ministry called it a clear military provocation, and they plan to submit the results of their findings to the United Nations. North Korea has hundreds of unmanned area vehicles in its possession, and dozens of others are believed to have flown over the south before returning safely to the north. When modified, experts say these surveillance purpose drones could hold up to 10 kilograms of explosives. It's raised concerns about possible attacks, and the South Korean military admits a gap in its security. While it says it's well equipped to deal with enemy jet incursions and attack UAVs, they have a much harder time detecting these smaller drones. Seoul says it plans to purchase low altitude radar and other military gadgetry to prevent further infiltrations. Kim Hyun Bin, Arirang News. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion years. Korea's foreign exchange reserves have been steadily climbing over the last three years or so, and stores of foreign currencies swelled to an all-time high last month. The Bank of Korea said Thursday that the nation was holding $355.8 billion of foreign currency as of the end of April. That's up $1.5 billion from the previous month. It represents the 10th straight month of in increase. The central bank attributes the trend to the strong euro and rising investment profits. Korea had the seventh largest foreign reserves in the world as of the end of March. China leads the pack, followed by Japan and Switzerland. Now, if you love shopping and you love Korean clothes, cosmetics and other products, then you are in luck as online shopping is about to get a whole lot easier here in Korea. Starting at the end of this month, financial authorities will scrap the current system that requires consumers to use electronic banking certificates when making purchases of over 300,000 won or 290 US dollars from online shopping malls. Uh, the system as it stands actually makes it rather difficult for foreigners living in the country and people overseas to shop on these Korean sites. The measure is part of the government's deregulation drive, which attempts to cut out red tape that hampers business activities. Now, Samsung's, Samsung Group's IT unit, Samsung SDS, has announced its plans to go public. Kim Min-ji reports on what could be one of the biggest share sales in Korea this year. Samsung SDS, the IT solutions affiliate of Korea's largest conglomerate, Samsung Group, has announced plans to go public this year, expanding business to overseas markets. The company explained Wednesday that conglomerates are limited from participating in the public market, preventing growth. The CEO of Samsung SDS said it will make a new leap forward to secure new growth technology and pioneer in communication and healthcare services in markets abroad. Currently traded at around 144 U.S. dollars per share in the over-the-counter market, it is estimated that after the public listing, the company will be valued at around 10.8 billion U.S. dollars. This exceeds the value of LG Electronics and 10.7 billion, currently ranked 18th in the nation. With the company's announcement, Samsung is expected to speed up work to succeed the group to the children of Samsung's chairman, Lee Gon Hee. Speaking to Seoul-based Yonab News, a researcher at IBK Securities said he believes the company will move to divide its business and make bigger changes in the future to help cement the top shareholders' influence within the group. Samsung Electronics currently holds the largest share of more than 22 percent of Samsung SDS. Lee Dae-yong, the first son of Lee gon -hee, holds over 11 percent of the company's shares, while daughters Lee Bu jin and Lee ha yun both have over 3 percent of the company's total shares. IPO lead managers will be selected this month, along with a decision on the size of the share offering. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Korea has risen to become one of the world's richest countries in the space of just a few decades, really. But when it comes to life satisfactions, Koreans still rank near the bottom of the list. Korea scored six points out of ten on the OECD Better Life Index 2014, putting it 25th among the 36 nations surveyed. 
The index measures the happiness quotient of a nation based on 11 categories, including education, work and life balance, as well as health. The average for the 36 nations came to 6.6. .6. The OECD cited Korea's propensity for working long hours for its low ranking. Koreans work an average of 2,090 hours a year. That's roughly 40 hours a week, which is much higher than the OECD average of over 1,700 hours or 34 hours a week. Australia topped the list as most satisfied country, followed by Norway and Sweden. And this just coming in, Korea Central Bank has left its key interest rate unchanged for the 12th straight month in May, and that's at 2.5%. And we'll bring you more details on that in our next newscast at noon Korea time. Time now for a look through our international headlines. For that, we connect live to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Centre. As always, a very good morning to you, Eunice. Now, Nigeria's president has expressed his hope that the now global effort to bring the, these hundreds of girls home, missing schoolgirls home, will also bring the full force of international justice to the Islamist militant group Boko Haram. That's right, Mark. President Goodluck Jonathan made that comment at the World Economic Forum his country is hosting in Abuja, saying he believes the kidnap of these girls will be, quote, the beginning of the end of terror in Nigeria. He also thanked the U.S., U.K., France and China for their offers of help during his speech. This as more disturbing news emerges out of northeastern Nigeria, where surviving residents of the town hit with that marketplace massacre on Monday say 310 bodies were found buried in the days following. Now, Nigeria's government, who said the Islamist terror group Boko Haram was behind those attacks in Gamboro, Nagala, put the official death toll under 150. Moving on over to eastern Ukraine, where pro-Russian separatists have declared they will move forward with Sunday's referendum vote for self-rule. This despite Russian President Vladimir Putin's call earlier to postpone the vote to create conditions for dialogue. A leader of the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic told reporters while they were grateful to Putin, the People's Council had voted unanimously to hold the poll as planned. Millions of ballots asking whether the voter supports an independent sovereignty have already been prepared as Ukrainian uh, authorities pledged their anti-terror operations will continue. And a magnitude 6.4 earthquake shook Mexico Thursday noon local time. The U.S. Geological Survey put the center of that tumbler 96 kilometers northwest of Acapulco in the southern Guerrero state, the same area that was hit with a 7.2 quake less than a month earlier. The 6.4 tumbler was strong enough to be felt in the capital, Mexico City, some 270 kilometers away, though no major damage was reported. U.S. SGS had earlier put the quake's magnitude at 6.8, but revised it down to 6.4 in the afternoon. And storms, droughts, floods, and even more earthquakes are forecast in the coming months. The warning comes from various weather authorities who say this year's El Nino will come earlier and strike a heavier blow. The Australian Bureau of Meteorology says there's a 70% chance the warming of subsurface seawater in the Pacific could arrive as early as July, citing recent data that recorded temperature readings several degrees higher than previous El Nino years. The trend affects wind patterns that could trigger extreme weather in different parts of the globe. Climatologists also say this year's El Nino could make 2014 the hottest year on record. And good morning, everyone. As we kick things off with the South Korean national football team, with manager Hong Myung-bo announcing his 23-man roster on Thursday. 
And just like many people expected, no big surprises in the 23-man roster as manager Hong Myung-bo chose 17 players from overseas and six players from the K-League, the most number of overseas players on the roster. And while there weren't any surprises, many experts believe that Mainz defender Park Chu ho was snubbed as manager Hong Myung-bo decided to go with Yoon seo kyung of the Queen's Park Rangers instead. And despite three goalkeepers being chosen on the roster, it's still uncertain whether Chung sung Young will start with his recent struggle on the national team. And moving over to badminton, where Lee yong dae has returned to the national team after being reinstated from his one-year suspension earlier this year. And of course, it's the first time in four months that Lee yong dae has trained with the national team as Kim Gi-jung, who was also reinstated, joined the national team as well. Now, both players just started their training at the National Training Center and will hold a press conference regarding their return on the 12th. They're also set to compete for the first time this year in New Delhi in preparation for the upcoming Asian Games in Incheon. And more roster announcements, this time over to the South Korean national basketball team, who after announcing their 24-man preliminary roster earlier, cut nine players on the team and have announced their 15-man roster. And in the latest roster, two notable players left off the roster are Ha Seung Jin, who has just returned from his military service, and half Korean star Boon Tae Jung. And instead, the team will be led by a younger group of players, with the team set to start training at the National Training Center on the 19th before beginning their international competition at the end of June. And now finishing things off with some Thursday night's KBO action, the Hanwha Eagles beat the LG Twins 6-2 to win the series with the Tucson Bears avoiding the sweep with a six-home run game beating the Lotte Giants 15-6 and the Samsung Lions cruise past the SK Wyverns 5-0. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the two teams fighting for first place here as the NC Dinos took on the Nixon Heroes. Of course, going on to the game, here we go over to the first inning of the game. Here's Ite Gun sending one to deep left field. Gone a solo shot, puts Nexon up 1 0. But next batter, Pak Byung Ho, drives this one to deep center field and forget about it. Back to back dingers, and Nexon's up 2 0. Third inning, here's Pak Byung Ho once again, this time a sack fly to right as Hagon Chang scores, and it's 3 0 Nexon. Seventh inning, here come the Dino Chi Seo Kun. RBI single to center field, and it's 3 to 1. Next batter, Mo Chang Min, doubles to left center field, and we're tied 3 to 3. But bottom of the ninth inning drama here, bases loaded, one man out. Lee Tae-gun flies out to right here. Kim Ji-soo, he's got a tag up here, and that's the game winner as the Nexon Heroes win this one, 4 to 3. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great weekend, everyone, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Unlike chilly start to the morning, temperatures will rebound nicely to the mid-20s across the region. In fact, this warmth will continue till tomorrow with high in Seoul soaring to 26 degrees Celsius. But nationwide showers on Sunday will drag down the temperatures a few notches. But right now, there is hardly any clouds hovering over the peninsula, and it should remain this sunny throughout the day. So the UV level will be relatively higher than usual across the region. So don't forget to apply a good amount of sunblock before heading out today. And it seems like people in the east will also need to stay hydrated with dry weather advisory is still in effect. Now over in Jindo, weather conditions will finally cooperate for the rescue operation with calm winds and waves. Also the speed of tidal currents will remain slow. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The high in Seoul and Daegu will rise to 24 and 26, while Gwangju tops out at 25 and Busan should top out at 22. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like down on Jeju will rise to 22, 
Daejeon reaches 24, while Dokdo and Mok Gyeonggang should see a high of 16 and 9, respectively. Well, that's all I have for you at this hour, but I'll be back with more updates afternoon. And that's all we have for now. We'll be back at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.